it is my pleasure to welcome Landon Cox here. Uh, Landon is currently at uh, Duke University, and uh, he got his PhD in 2005 uh, with Brian Noble at the University of Michigan. And he's been work, working on uh, privacy and trust issues in mobile systems. And uh, he has become pretty much a ubiquitous fixture in the ubiquitous computing community as well. Uh, he's kind of everywhere at every conference, both with papers and on program committees. Definitely one of the young stars in this area. So looking forward to his talk. Thanks, Len. Thanks, Gaetano. Can everybody hear me OK? OK, good. OK, um, so uh, as is normally the case for these talks, please raise your hand and ask questions if, uh, if you have any throughout. Okay. So the title of the talk today is How to Stop Worrying and Trust Mobile Systems. Um, and to start out, I want to talk about the evolution of these mobile devices. So we started looking at mobile phones around 2005, um, and we were specifically looking at these Nokia 6670 devices. Um, and the difference between the devices we were playing around with then and now is, is pretty stark. So here's the uh, evolution of the devices as seen through Moore's Law, but this is really the least interesting part of their evolution. Um, so one of the more interesting aspects of how they've evolved is their connectivity. So when you had a device that could only communicate via GPRS, you really couldn't do all that much. Um, and the difference between these connections and a modern 3G or 4G uh, connection is pretty profound. So now our devices can communicate with services um, through a high quality link pretty much at all times. Okay. So the other interesting aspect of how these devices have evolved uh, is their sensing and localization capability. So um, in 2005, you had a really crappy one megapixel camera. The phone didn't really know where it was. Um, and by now, you don't really need a standalone uh, camera at all. You just take along your camera phone and it's good enough. Um, and then we sort of take for granted that our phone knows where it is at all times now. OK? So using these sensors and the connectivity, we have a platform in which devices are moving around all the time. They have these sensors, and they can participate in services that live in the cloud. OK? So the data that's collected by these sensors um, is very rich. It's often sensitive, things like our location, things like our images. Um, and the services that can be provided through the scale of the cloud um, profoundly affect our life. So we can share our data with lots of different um, kinds of services, and we can share that with hundreds of millions of people. Okay. So here's a more visual uh, uh, presentation of the same idea, which is we have this device which sort of sits at the heart of, of this ecosystem. Um, it's mobile. It's with us, whether we're at work, um, whether we're at home, whether we're out playing. Um, through its sensors, it can collect all kinds of rich personal data. And then we can participate in all sorts of wonderful services that exist in the cloud by sharing this data. Okay? And so it shouldn't be a surprise that this platform has become a first class development platform. Um, so this is a standard uh, chart of the growth of the App Store. And as of January of this past year, there are about 350,000 apps. OK. So one of the key questions is, well, OK, now we have apps. Why is that really different um, than what we had on the desktop? Um, and I think the best way I can describe it is that um, the desktop was very user-centric, um, and mobile is very app-centric. And what I mean by this is that um, the processes that executed on the desktop, um, we just sort of assumed that those processes executed on behalf of the user who was sitting in front of the machine. Um, and when we have an app, it's really unclear on whose behalf it's executing at any moment in time. Okay? So the operating systems for these devices, really they manage um, apps now instead of users. And you see this in the Android platform itself, where every single app is assigned a unique identifier and isolated within its own sort of virtual uh, sandbox. Okay? So these apps have access to lots of sensitive information across lots of um, contexts. Um, and so the real question here is, um, on whose behalf are they running? If it's not only the user, who actually has a stake in what's going on with the app? Um, and so you can think about users. You can think about remote services. Um, you can think about the developers, because they have to give these things away um, and then still collect revenue. Um, there are the platform providers, like Google and Apple. Um, and then there are the advertisers and the analytics firms, whose libraries are often linked um, with these apps. So the higher level um, idea here is that these apps have lots of 
stakeholders. Okay? And then the question is, um, what happens to that data as it goes through the cloud? So we've been looking at um, the sort of emerging ecosystem for a while. Um, and we've developed some new services. Uh, we've looked at more privacy preserving architectures for this world. Um, and then we've looked at how we can monitor the way the information flows through these apps. And I think the key challenge is along, um, along this edge right here, which is how do we understand and manage the data that flows between these devices and the cloud? OK. So I want to acknowledge all of the wonderful collaborators that I've uh, been lucky enough to work with, some of whom are in this room, um, and in particular, my students, who have really been the, work the workhorses of my group. So Peter and Eduardo, whose uh, pictures are down below. OK, so here's a roadmap of the rest of the talk. I'm going to talk about two systems that we've developed, one called Uproof um, and one called Smile. And then I'll wrap up with some conclusions. So we have these devices that kind of act as the eyes and ears of the internet through their sensors. Um, and there are tremendous opportunities um, to build on this platform. So uh, services like citizen journalism, uh, you can look at CNN's iReport or Al Jazeera Chirac. Uh, mobile social services, Foursquare, but also maybe richer kinds of services uh, like Microblog, which is something that we developed. Um, and then all kinds of monitoring, so traffic monitoring, parking monitoring, price monitoring. So one of the key challenges here, though, is that the authenticity of the data is really crucial for the correctness of these services. So if they get garbage data, they're just going to give you garbage service. Okay? And the critical thing here is that this user-generated content is becoming increasingly important. So if you look at the events in Iran or Egypt, in Libya, our knowledge of what was going on there was really a result of just anonymous participants uploading photos and video. Um, and so if you can imagine governments over time um, getting wise to these kinds of services, they can, might inject false data, and that could potentially have very dire consequences for our understanding of uh, what's going on. Okay. So this is what we'd like to be able to do. Distinguish what's real and what's fake. Okay. So on the bottom we have sort of the positive side of uh, participatory sensing. And up here we have some instances of where people have faked the data that they've contributed. Okay. So you might say, well, don't we already know how to deal with this? Um, so one approach is to try and rely on the reputations of the people who are contributing data. Um, but unfortunately, in a lot of these situations, they want to contribute anonymously. So we might not know who they are. Um, and also, a lot of times, people won't contribute at all until there's some critical moment. Like, I doubt many of the people who are uploading photos from Egypt had really participated in a citizen journalism service prior to that event happening. So we didn't have a history um, on which to base a reputation. And then if we don't have some sort of solid notion of identity, um, these kinds of services also can become vulnerable to civil attacks. Okay? Well, then maybe we can rely on voting. We'll just look at all of the images and then see what large percentage of them say, and then we'll say that that's the truth. Okay. Well, unfortunately, again, if we don't have a strong notion of identity, yeah? What's a civil attack? So the question is, what's a civil attack? Um, a civil attack is one in which an adversary can create lots of identities at a very low cost and therefore just pretend to be lots of people even though they're a single person. So they create a lot of YouTube accounts or something. OK. Um, so for trying to apply voting to these systems, um, it may be, again, the case that it's vulnerable to civil attacks. Um, it may be that there are only a few observers of any single important event. And then it's not even clear how you would formulate a vote among something as rich as an image. You take a bunch of images and then try to create a vote. It's not clear how you do that. It's not like a temperature reading. So ourselves and a few other people have said, well, why don't we try and build a solution based on some kind of hardware we can introduce to the device? Okay? So our approach is going to be to add a uh, secure hardware, like a trusted platform module, a TPM. Um, so I'm not going to go over the details of what a TPM is or what it does. Um, there's some basic functionality that you need to know about. So it includes a private key. It's tamper resistant. Um, it can compute hashes and attest to the software that's running on the device. Okay? So the pertinent functionality here is that the trusted hardware provides trustworthy attestation of 
a computing base for a software of a device. Or basically, I mean the platform, or the firmware. Okay? So here we have um, our little TPM down here. And it has a key. And it could do something like sign that the SHA-1 hash of the boot partition and the system partition is this value, and then sign that that's the case. And then it can present that to some external observer, and then the observer knows exactly what the firmware of the device is. Okay? So I'm not going to um, display that throughout my slide. I'm going to do something like this, where I'm going to say, the TPMT says that my firmware is F, where F is just the cryptographic hash of some bag of bits. Okay? Okay. So if you have this TPM, this trusted hardware, um, one thing that you can do is now you can use it to sign the readings that come off of the sensors. Okay? So you could have a TPM that attests to um, the boot partition and the system partition, which includes the kernel. And then the kernel could say, well, I read this image off of my sensors, and it's unmodified. Okay? So you could say, the TPM says, the firmware says, image is I. Okay, and then when a remote service receives the image, it just checks the sign statement and makes sure that the hash of what it has matches this I. Yes. So maybe we'll uh, talk about this later, but will this have issues for uh, plausible deniability for anybody who wants to remain anonymous and then deny that they submitted an image? Ah, so that's a great question. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, there's a fundamental tension here between, oh, uh, so the question is, um, is, are, you give, uh, are you leaving room for plausible deniability? Or is everything that comes off the device then linked to a single um, piece of hardware? Which is a great question. Um, so there's a fundamental tension here between the need to ward off civil attacks, where people can create as many identities as they want, um, and the need to preserve anonymity, where a user might not want all of their data to be tied to a single uh, piece of hardware. So, our solution involves um, leveraging some of the TPM um, spec, which allows you to create extra public-private key pairs, um, install them on the device, and then have some external uh, certificate authority uh, sign certificates for those keys. And our basic approach is you can have some small number of these externally certified keys assigned to your hardware. So you have a bunch of pseudonyms, but a limited number of pseudonyms. And as long as that certificate authority isn't compromised, everything should be OK. You can generate it. You can sign as much as you want with these other keys, rather than the single key in the, in the TPM. Finding that exact number is difficult. I don't know. It could be 6 or 10 or 12. We're not quite sure. Other questions? OK. okay. So the problem here is that once you've signed off, on this image, um, the data can't be modified. Okay? Because if you modify the data, you change the hash, and then that changes all of the statements. Okay? And we actually need to modify the data. Okay? Because as has been well known for about 20 years, um, mobile clients need to control the fidelity of the data that they handle. And they need to do this for any number of reasons. So um, efficient resource usage. I don't want to upload the full resolution image to my service because that's going to cost a lot of energy. It'll use up a lot of bandwidth. I want to use some reduced resolution version of an image to upload. Um, also for privacy. There may be some faces in the image that I want to upload. And I'd like to, say, crop out people, or I'd like to blur faces before I upload. And these are all legitimate modifications that alter the data hash. Okay? So we'd like something that lets us um, apply these kind of legitimate modifications, and yet still know that the fundamental meaning of the image that's uploaded is authentic. So what we really have is a tension between the need to provide data authenticity um, and data fidelity. Okay. So our goals are that we'd like the service to be able to verify the authenticity of the data that mobile clients hand over to it. Um, but we'd also like to give clients the ability to control the fidelity of the data that they hand over. And this is for a variety of reasons. And so the system we built to try and resolve this issue is called UProof. Okay. So the key question for uh, developing UProof was, well, where do we place this code that manages the fidelity of the data? Okay. 
So here's one way you might imagine structuring the system. You have some third-party app. Um, the fidelity of reducing code is in the trusted computing base below this gray line. Uh, so everything below the gray line is trusted by the service. Everything above it um, is untrusted. So the third-party application says, here's my image. Please apply this um, operation to the image. Uh, the fidelity reducer then makes a statement through the TPM saying, here's what I did to the image. Here is my input. Here is my output. So the statement ends up, there we go, being TPM says that the OS says, I modified image I into image I prime. Okay? So basically, we do the fidelity reduction on behalf of the third-party app. Okay. The problem is that lots of apps modify the fidelity of their data on their own. And if suddenly they have to rely on some trusted piece of software to do this, we have to modify all of them. So this is going to require significant refactoring of literally thousands of apps. And it's not just image editors. So lots of sharing apps manage the fidelity of the data they upload. So for example, the Facebook app um, will reduce the resolution of the images that it uploads to Facebook, because Facebook has limitations on how large the images um, that it accepts will be. Um, I don't know if any of you use Instagram, but they also require users to reduce the resolution of the images they upload to a 612 pixel by 612 pixel um, box. Okay? So if we place the fidelity reducing code inside the trusted computing base, we have to change all of these apps, which we'd rather not have to do. Okay. Here's option two. Let's say we have some app that has some fidelity reducing reducing functionality baked in. And we just say, OK, we know that app. We're going to trust that that app knows what it's doing. And we'll trust that app to tell us what kind of modification it made. Okay, So here we say that the TPM, there we go. TPM says, the operating system says, our trusted app says, I made this modification to image i and got this image i prime out. OK, so we're basically, we're trusting the app that's going to perform the modification. The problem here is that now we've severely limited the choice of applications that users can run. They can only run the applications that their services trust. Okay? And this undermines the explosion of development activity surrounding these devices. Okay? So the alternative is that services, rather than trusting one app, now have to trust all of the apps. But that's not really feasible either. They can't go around and uh, look at all of the code for these developers to decide whether they trust their code or not. OK. So here's the key observation. The problem with options one and two is that they provide um, trusted synthesis of, of data. Okay? So this is very similar to an approach that relies on a trusted compiler, where you have some piece of code. You trust the compiler. The compiler compiles the code into some binary format. And then it signs a statement saying, here's exactly what I did to this data. Here are the properties that that binary now has. So we're going to take a different approach. We're going to apply trusted analysis rather than trusted synthesis. Okay, so here's our architecture. Um, so we have our application, which has its fidelity reducing, re reducing functionality intact. It takes an image. It does whatever it wants to it. And it spits out some result. And then in the trusted computing base, we simply take a look at the input and the output, and we perform an analysis of the difference between the two. Okay? So if you know here the statement is, let me get my, the TPM says that the OS says, here's the difference between I and I prime. So we don't have to trust the thing that's modifying. We just have to trust something to tell us how its output is different. Okay? So this delta down here, something we'll call a fidelity certificate, and the nice thing is that the analyzer just attests to um, the difference in content between this original um, data item and this derived data item. So that's at a very high level what we're doing. Okay. So the nice thing about this is that users can use whatever app they want. We don't trust the app anyway. We just care about um, its inputs and outputs. Okay. And then a client, all they have to do is just send their modified image, and then sign, uh, send the fidelity certificate that describes um, the particular piece of data. 
So the key question in this, what's the fidelity certificate? What is this, this delta function? Okay. So here's what it looks like at a high level. I don't expect you to parse this. Um, so part of it is an attestation of the software configuration of the device. So that's what this little PCR bit is. And then there's a report digest, which tells us something about um, the difference between the original and the derived item. And all of this is signed by the TPM. Okay. So here's a more intuitive sense of what um, these fidelity certificates look like. Okay, so on the left we have the source image, which is sort of a, uh, an obviously a, a toy image. And on the left, or on the right, we have our derived image. Okay, so you'll notice that some of these uh, cells are green. And the green blocks simply mean that um, the green blocks preserve the meaning of the original. Okay, so you're noticing that all of those green cells, they're identical to the ones on the left. And in the ones that aren't green, it means that um, we cannot verify the authenticity of these blocks. So there's been some local modifications to those regions of the image, and we can't say anything about those regions, but we can still attest to the fact that the rest of it is authentic. So here's an example. Um, so here's our original image I. This is my um, student, Henry. Henry was an undergrad. Um, so what we've done here, we've taken an original image. We've reduced its fidelity to a low resolution version. And I don't know if you can see this, uh, but there's a black box on top of Henry's face to anonymize him. Okay. So we have our type specific analyzer, which knows, OK, these are images. I know how to interpret images. And I'm going to spit out a fidelity certificate, which essentially lets me um, know which parts of the image are sufficiently different. Okay? So it can describe things like whether it's been scaled, if it's been cropped. Um, and we can apply any kind of similarity metric that you might want to throw at it for any of these subblocks. So this is a general framework for reasoning about the similarity of rich media. And we implement this using off-the-shelf computer vision and audio analysis. So we're not doing anything innovative on the computer vision side. We're just using OpenCV. Yes? Can you talk a little bit about the uh, complexity of the analyzer versus the complexity of the reducer? Because to me, it, it seems like in order to be able to tell that I1 and, and I prime are related, you have to be able to do most of the transformation within the type-specific analyzer. So can you talk about that a bit? OK. So the type-specific analyzer doesn't actually perform any modifications. Um, essentially, what we have to do to perform the analysis, we have to get them both into the same representation so that we can compare the two. So um, in that sense, we are going to have to transform I, for example, into grayscale. And we're going to have to scale it down to the same size as the I prime. So in that sense, it is performing some modifications. Um, uh, so I, I mean, I can tell you about the computer vision algorithms. We're using SURF, basically, to perform that mapping so we can get them in the same representation. Um, and that's, that's actually pretty cheap. Um, it's not all that complex. Um, and then we do other things. Once we can get them in the same representation and break it down into cells, we compare each individual associated cell, each of the associated cells um, pairwise with each other. And we come up with a general metric for each of those pairwise. If you get it into grayscale, can I, in the upper red area, write in green yeah. at the same intensity and it'll go through your system? Potentially. Yeah, I mean, so you can still mount some forms of attack. Um, and it's also possible to go back and look at different kinds of metrics. So we could measure the RGB distribution for each cell if that's something that we're really worried about. So I don't want to get too caught up on the individual techniques we're applying, because I think computer vision is a fantastic field. And they know how to deal with exactly these kinds of problems, even though we've just kind of used the most naive things. Um, I guess I'm a little confused. If you're signing documents that, that that have detailed information about all the deltas between the images, 
why would you go and formulate this um, this fidelity certificate instead of just rolling back the deltas to see the original image? All you can think about is the authenticity. Um, so it's not a reversible function. We don't necessarily. It's, it, it, it's not um, so. Delta is just. Um, it's not a literal delta. Um, do you know if uh, computer vision folks have analyzed your stuff with respect to accuracy against an adversary? Um, it seems like that's the problem you're creating for them, which is interesting. Yeah, so I know that some computer vision people do care about adversarial situations, like um, trying to pick out terrorists in a, a lineup or a video or something like that. Um, I'm not sure that it's the common case to think that you're dealing with an adversary. Do you also handle a case where multiple images are reduced into one, or uh, just one-to-one -one mapping? So we can detect um, when an image is a composition of multiple images. But the analyzers will basically, at the end of the day, saying, I don't know what this is. It doesn't really look like either of them, either of them in isolation. And I think, really, we're just trying to deal with things like scaling and cropping and reduction in resolution changes of compression algorithm, um, rather than these sort of thornier cases that I don't think we'd be able to handle very well. Other questions? Yes. Sure. So this actually kind of brings up what I was going to So if you're really worried about scaling and cropping and things like this, you have to have scaling and cropping inside the type-specific analyzer. And if all that an application can do and still have things be detected is scaling and cropping, then aren't you basically writing the application again inside of your type-specific analyzer? It's doing some of the same kinds of modifications. Um, so in a sense, I mean, yeah, there's duplication of functionality. But we don't have to change the app. Right? We don't have to go, the app writer doesn't have to go back and like pull out all of that functionality. Maybe they're doing it in a way that is really efficient and they really like. Um, so. It's nice that we don't have to touch the app, even though we are potentially duplicating some functionality. Other questions? OK. OK, so we've also done this for audio. Um, basically, we can look at um, two audio clips, um, and we can map one uh, subclip from the derived version to the original, and we can pick out uh, parts of the derived subclip that don't match. So we built a prototype on top of Android. Um, here's the architecture. The, uh, the green bits are things that we've added. The blue bits are just stock, uh, stock Android. Um, so basically, the two partitions on the bottom, the system partition and the boot partition, make up the ROM for the device. And that's the trusted computing base. So anything below that sort of top dotted line is, is trusted. Um, so these devices don't actually have TPMs. Uh, and so we basically ported a software TPM emulator into the to Android um, and stuck that in the boot partition. Um, we can't actually do measured boot, but it basically um, uh, quotes the the boot partition right after it actually boots. So it's not actually secure, but um, <clears throat> it's good enough for sort of prototyping. Um, inside of oh, okay, um, so. Whenever an application requests sensor data, like um, an image, we have to log it so that we can go back and perform a comparison. So we store that um, in a database. Um, the way that we figure out whether um, an input and an output are related is through uh, Taintroid. So we basically tag the data with a unique tag that's related to the specific invocation of the API. Um, and then as that data propagates through an application while it's running, um, if it writes to the network or writes to the file system, then we can backtrack and say, OK, well, this data is derived from this particular API call, and then look into the log and perform the comparison at that point. Okay. So we have a bunch of um, services um, for generating fidelity certificates, um, as well as performing the logging. Um, and so, yeah, once we see that an application writes a tainted output, we invoke the right type-specific um, analyzer, whether it's audio or photo in our current prototype. Okay. So all of these components um, are secured within the Android security framework. Uh, we explicitly did not try to create 
a teeny tiny trusted computing base um, using an experimental operating system. Um, we just sort of did the most expedient thing, which is stick it into Android so that we could get something up and running that we could uh, play around with. I think there's a lot of interesting research to be done in how to minimize the trusted computing base of something like Uproof, but we haven't done that work yet. Any questions? Okay. Um, so like I said, we've implemented two analyzers, one for photos, um, one for audio. Um, so the way that we get the, uh, the scaling factors, we apply SURF, which is uh, a well-known computer vision algorithm. Um, once we've got two images which are the same size, then we divide it into these cells. And then for each associated cell, we compute a sum of squared differences, which is also a well-known similarity metric for computer vision, although we don't claim that it's the best. It just seems to work pretty well. And I'm not going to talk about the audio analyzer. OK. So the key question is, um, OK, you've built this nice general framework in which you can analyze media. But is this feasible? Given even sort of simple, uh, naive approach, does this stuff actually work? OK. So um, for the photo data, we took 69 photographs with our Nexus 1 phone, our U-Prove Nexus 1. Um, and then we applied a series of global modifications to these images. So these are the kinds of um, modifications that we would like to support. Things like cropping, things like scaling, things like compression. Um, so if you apply these, we should be able to detect that it doesn't really affect the meaning of the image. OK, so we also introduced some local modifications, which are things that we should not be attesting to. OK, so we can insert a black box. Um, we can insert a large or a small image, or we can blur some region. OK, so these are the parts of the image that we should just say, these are sufficiently different. We can't attest anything to, uh, attest to them. OK, so just for terminology on the next slides, um, a clean block is one that only received a global modification. So it's just cropped, just scaled, or received extra compression. OK, so here are the results for cropping and various levels of JPEG compression. Um, so along the x-axis, we have um, per pixel sum of square difference bins. And really, I don't expect you to understand that metric, other than what you want to see is um, a spread between uh, the clean and the local modifications. OK? Because really, what we're going to have to do is set a threshold um, for this PPSSD, which cleanly separates something as um, something that we can attest to or something that we can't attest to. All right. So for cropping, it's pretty clear. 100% of the clean blocks had a PPSSD of less than 50, and 99.5% of the dirty blocks um, had a PPSSD of 50. Okay? So 50 is a very nice threshold in this case. Um, and it also works pretty well for various levels of JPEG compression. Uh, uh, line of 50 will do a nice job separating the two. Scaling is a little different. Okay? So um, if we scale the image 75%, then the threshold of 50 is still pretty good. Um, if we have scaling of less than 50%, say 25%, um, then we need a higher threshold. Okay? 50 is not so good. 100 seems to work better. Um, the nice thing is that we actually know the scaling factor, because SURF gives us so if you're a surface, you can look at this report and you can say, oh, well, the scaling factor is 25%. Therefore, I should set my PPSSD threshold to 100 or more. And that will cleanly separate clean from dirty. Yep. Did you take a look at how many um, pictures that have been taken by mobile devices that have been posted on Twitter or Facebook, anywhere else, have had modifications? What type of modifications or if those have been? And if those modifications have been done on a mobile device or on a computer? Um, that's a good question. Um, so in terms of trying to fake an image, it's all anecdotal. Um, so there are some, there are some uh, headlines I had earlier that are pretty recent, where people have actually tried to do bad things. Um, if you're uploading anything through Facebook, its resolution is reduced. right? If you upload, I don't know actually what it is for like TwitPic or something like that. But it's not uncommon for these services to require clients to at least reduce the resolution or apply extra compression to reduce the load on their servers. But in terms of specific numbers, I don't think we have them. 
Is uh, are those uh, compressions usually done on the phone by the? Yeah. Okay. It's baked into the client because you want to save energy of sending out the data or to improve the performance of sending the data out. So yeah, you do it on the client. So kind of going with this, taking the bigger picture and considering desk desktops in this, um, isn't all this trivially workaroundable by just faking the photo, printing it out, and taking another picture of it? <laughs> so that's a good question. Um, I don't know if trivially. We certainly can't uh, do anything about attacks on the sensors themselves. So if you want to stage a photograph, we'll attest to it. If you take a photograph of a photograph, um, we'll attest to that as well. Um, it came up in the, the student discussion. Somebody was asking exactly this question. And I think another student um, answered it really well, actually, which is that it's relatively easy to detect pictures of pictures as opposed to all possible attacks. So we've sort of narrowed the um, range of attacks to which somebody might be vulnerable to something which you might have a shot at, at detecting. But yeah, there are clearly limitations. There's only so much we can do within the device itself. Once you start monkeying around with the environment of the device, kind of all bets are lost. Other questions? Yes? What uh, algorithm did you use for scaling? Did you use the same algorithm in the detection as you did uh, to do the actual scaling? Um, the algorithm, are you talking about like for this? I'm talking about when you scale photos, you have to, you have an algorithm by which you select uh, sort of like which pixels you want to, to take, like what, what the representation should be when you shrink. Right. So I'm curious if you use the same algorithm uh, when, within your verifier as you did. And you're talking about these experiments? Yes. Yeah. We use different algorithms. Yeah. We use, we, um, so for these, yeah, for these, I think we used um, image magic on the desktop. And that's a different algorithm than what was on the device itself. Yeah, no, that's, that's actually a very good question. So you might also be wondering how long it takes to generate these certificates. Um, so I first want to point out, uh, we don't have to do these in line. Um, we can very easily generate these certificates asynchronously. Basically, you assign an identifier to the certificate, you insert it into the EXIF data for the image, you send the image off, and then in the background, you sort of post the certificate later on. Okay? So to analyze JPEGs of various sizes, it takes about 30 seconds. Um, you, if you were really concerned about this, you could wait to do it until the phone was plugged in and charging. Um, it took about 20 seconds to analyze a 36 or a 30-second MP3, uh, 60 seconds to analyze a five-minute MP3. So sound was a little bit more. Um, uh, uh, sound took a little bit longer if the clip was longer. Um, in terms of power, well, we're really pegging the CPU to do this analysis, which, why, which is why it may make sense to just do it when you're charging, since there's no rush to get the certificate out. Um, but generally speaking, it's somewhere between um, the cost of playing music and the cost of recording video. So, and you probably won't be generating these certificates all the time. OK, um, so there have been a couple of projects looking at how to build uh, software architectures on top of trusted hardware. I think um, one of the biggest projects is the Nexus project from Cornell. Uh, so they also built a trusted image editor called Certipix, which is basically the option two in my um, series of options. There was also the Notabot work from NSDI a few years ago where they were trying to associate clicks on the physical keyboard with network transmissions. Um, but they didn't really have to deal with uh, transformation of data. Or anything. Um, and then Flickr was a nice paper from Eurosys 08 that described how to do uh, late launch on uh, uh, when there's a TPM around. OK, and then there have been a couple of people looking at this data authenticity question. There was a paper at HotSec uh, by Duo basically said we can build sensors that can sign their readings. Um, and then Stefan Sario and Alec Woolman have looked at various aspects of this um, at Hot Mobile the last few years. OK, so any other questions on UPROV before I move on? OK. OK, so I have, what, 10 minutes left? OK. Um, all right, so now I'm going to talk about a different service where trust is, um, trust rears its ugly head in a slightly different way. OK, so that was 
so uproof is really about um, services and who they can trust. This is much more about users and who users can trust. Okay. So depending on your level of paranoia, uh, if you're a user, you may or may not trust your service provider. Uh, you may or may not trust your app developer, and you may or may not trust other users. Okay? So the question is, um, if we have a minimal set of trust assumptions, can we still do something useful? Okay? And what would a service with a very limited number of trust assumptions actually look like? Okay, so let me walk you through a scenario. You've got Alice and Bob. Um, they're sitting there waiting for the subway, um, and they have a moment. So they fall in love. But sadly for Alice, Bob takes off. Okay, so what does Alice do? She had this encounter with somebody, um, and now she wants to get in contact with Bob. But she has no good way of doing it. Okay, so the main idea here is we have two strangers that encounter one another, and they'd like to communicate at some point in the future. Okay, so my argument is that this is a generally useful form of communication. Okay, it would allow you to meet new people. You could retrieve lost items. You could participate in some ad hoc discussion with me after this lecture. Okay, so here's what Alice does today. All right, so she's sitting at home um, and she uploads to a website like Craigslist something like this, which is a posting that says, you know, we were uh, at this place at this time around the same, uh, at the same time we had a moment, and she has to wait for Bob to find that posting, and then maybe Bob will send her a message. Okay, so this is a Craigslist misconnection service. Um, so this service is inefficient because we have to wait for uh, Bob to look at this posting. It's inconvenient uh, for Bob to sort of constantly look through these messages. And then it's completely insecure because anybody can respond to any posting. Okay. So let's try and build something better using mobile devices. All right, so we've got Alice and we've got Bob. They have self-localizing devices. Um, and we have this matching service that lives in the cloud. So Alice and Bob are periodically sending their location um, information to the matching service. At some point, Alice says, hey, what was going on at Astor Place around midnight? I'd like to talk to other people who are at that uh, place at that time. The service says, oh, Bob was there. Let me send a message to Bob. And then Bob can say, uh, hi, let's get together. OK, so there are a number of problems with this approach as well. Um, it's definitely more efficient and convenient. It's still pretty insecure. Okay, so first of all, this location database could leak inadvertently. Um, the database is going to be vulnerable to some kind of insider abuse. And anybody can respond to anything, right? So anybody could say they're at Astor Place at midnight. Okay, so the problem over you is that we have a setup in which there's extremely limited trust. Okay, the users are strangers. They don't have shared keys. They don't know anything about one another. Um, they're walking around. They don't. They want to remain anonymous until the very moment when they want to talk to somebody, um, and they don't completely trust the matching service. Okay, so our goals are threefold. We want to protect users' location privacy. We want to allow users to prove that they actually had an encounter, um, and then we'd like to protect users' uh, encounter privacy as well. So I'm going to go through the first part of our solution, which is a system called Smile. OK. So the high-level approach is actually embedded in what people do today. All right, so if you look at this posting, you'll notice that um, the poster is asking for specific information about the encounter. Okay. So she's asking, what stop did we both get off at, and what color sneakers were you wearing? Okay, presumably, only the person that she's thinking of would be able to answer these questions. Um, so what we would like to do is something similar, but make it cryptographically secure. Anybody can guess a sneaker color, right? Um, so that it's difficult for absent parties to be able to guess the answers to these questions. Okay. So we have three key techniques. One is a passive key exchange using short-range wireless um, communication. This is, enables secure communication between the parties. Um, we use uh, key hashing and logging so that particip participants can name their encounter to some other service without revealing their time and um, 
the time and place of the encounter. Um, and then in order to prevent the service from knowing who's communicating with whom, um, we can induce collisions at the server. And then resolve those collisions using the, the keys that we gathered. All right, so the passive key exchange. Basically, our, what we're trying to do is create some um, shared knowledge about an encounter that only devices that were co-located with one another can know. So Alice is going to broadcast some key periodically. She'll rotate the key or change the key so she's not broadcasting the same key all the time. She'll log where she was when she broadcast a particular key. Bob, when he receives this key, this beacon, he'll log where he was when he received that key. And then when Bob broadcasts a key, um, Alice will log his key as well. Okay, so only the people who are in the range of these radios should be able to record and log these keys. That's the main idea. OK, so we have these logs now. Alice, if she's interested in a particular time and place, she can say, or uh, she can say, I am interested in communicating with somebody who has also posted this hash. Okay? And then she can encrypt the message for that person using the key that they were all broadcasting. The matching service can say, oh, well, there were other users who uh, registered for that key or that hash, and forward the message on to Bob. Okay? And then Bob can decrypt the message because he has KA, and he can send her another message. OK, so the nice thing about this is that the matching service um, doesn't know anything about Alice's and Bob's locations. It really is just performing a very simple matching. I should point out that Apple pat, uh, filed a patent for something exactly like this. Um, they called it iGroups. Um, so who knows? Maybe you'll be seeing something like this soon, although it probably isn't as secure as ours. OK, so the high-level uh, uh, takeaway point, I think, for mobile uh, and why it's interesting and different is that the trust relationships are really much more tangled and messy than what we experience on the desktop. Okay? So there are tons of stakeholders. Um, there's the users, there's the developers, the analytics companies, the platform providers, service providers, um, infrastructure providers. Um, and the incentives between these uh, stakeholders are often misaligned. Okay? So what we'd like to do is realize the tremendous opportunities of these mobile platforms, but also protect users' interests. I'll take questions if you have any. Yep. Sorry to harp on the image similarity um, topic that's no, come up previously, but do you fear that the restrictions you're putting on the modifications apps can do to photos and restrict uh, creativity of future applications? No, you can modify it in any way you want. We just can't attest to the authenticity of that. OK, because uh, things like HDR or just even adjusting the white balance. Uh, yeah, that's right. Is there so, simple adjustments that would do a lot of damage to your metric? Yeah, that's right. So I think then you need to finely tune the analysis right, to look for certain kinds of it, ways of describing the edges or ways of describing the color balance. Um, you just need a richer feet, uh, suite of anal analysis um, is what I would say. Are you talking about the composition? No, I guess I'm talking about that type of thing. But every new idea you come up with can't be signed until the OS supports. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. Um, I would say that the authenticity of artistic imagery is not uh, for most importance, really. I, I think that if you're talking about um, documenting political events, um, the artistry wouldn't necessarily be in how you change the color balance. It would be more, maybe more in the framing. Um, but you're right. In a sense, there are certain kinds of modifications that we might always be trying to play catch up with. I think that's, that's fair to say. Um, uh, before in your slide, you had the original image on the untrusted side of the line. How do you verify that you actually got the original image uh. on the just? So thanks for pointing that out. Oh, so the question was, um, uh, in some of, my, some of my slides, I had the images above the line, and in some of them, I had them below the line. And I wouldn't read into that anything. The OS knows exactly what the image is. I just sort of put them above or below the line, depending on where the fidelity reducing um, box was. So yeah, sorry, that's, that's just a confusing picture as opposed to anything going on. 
Yeah. How long do you keep have to keep that uh, verification database around? Uh, um, that's a good question. Um, oh, so right. <laughs> so the question was, how long do you have to keep the database of um, data that you'd like to verify? The potentially indefinitely. Um, it depends on if there's at some point you real you figure I don't actually need to verify this image anymore, then you can get rid of it. Um, but if you think at some point you might want to upload it and have its authenticity verified, you just have to keep it around indefinitely. Thanks. Thanks.